Hey, welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. Um, I'm recording on, uh, let's see, it's Monday, uh, April 17th, and um, this is Erev Yom HaShoah, uh, 78 years since the end of the uh, uh, Shoah, the annihilation of European Jewry at the hands of the Germans and uh, their collaborators. And it's notable that uh, this week, uh, JNS reported uh, that uh, PFLP, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a line terrorist organization operating in Berlin called Samidun, uh, held a, uh, a march against uh, Israel and Jews in which 78 years, almost to the day of uh, the, the end of the Holocaust, or at least that's not true, uh, 78 uh, years after the Holocaust ended, um, these um, terrorists aligned with Samidun marched through the streets of Berlin calling jet, death to Israel, death to the Jews. So uh, courtesy of Palestinian terrorists, uh, the age-old call for the annihilation of Jewry is again being heard in the streets of Berlin. And while the EU recognizes that the PFLP is a terrorist organization, they've got a problem doing the same for Samidun, which is a, a PFLP front organization. Um, and Samidun uh, branches in Canada have held similar marches uh, in recent weeks and in other countries as well. So this is not just a phenomenon um, limited to Germany. And that really, I think, brings me to the point that I want to talk about in this opening um, that I'm recording on, on Erev Yom uh, You know, um, I don't have, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to talk about the Jews that were killed um, in Europe during World War II, during the Holocaust at the hands of the Nazis. I want to talk about what we mean when we say never again. Because one of the things that we've been seeing over the uh, past several decades is that we were so blinded as a people, maybe as a world, to the unique evil of the German murder machine of, uh, of Jewry in Europe between 1933 and 1945, that we fail to see other uh, aspects that are not unique. Uh, we fail to understand that genocidal Jew hatred is not a unique feature uh, in, in, in human uh, history. Uh, in fact, as we chanted just uh, a week ago uh, at uh, our Passover Seders, in every generation, uh, a nation comes and tries to destroy the Jews, and then God saves us. But the annihilating of the Jews, the chalotenu, to to destroy us, to to swallow us up, to to devour us, is uh, to inflame us, is um, is not a feature that was created by Adolf Hitler and Adolf Eichmann and all of the other Nazis in Germany. Um, it is it is it is something that has accompanied Jews through their history over the past three thousand five hundred years. And um, we allowed the magnitude of what Germany did to blind us to the fact that this is something that we faced in every generation. And in, and in recent decades, in the last 50 or so years, we've seen a new incarnation of this evil, of this concept that it's legitimate to annihilate the Jews. And that legitimization has come in the form of the Palestinian narrative against Israel. Because what we see in Palestinian identity as, as, a, as a distinct group is that it is based entirely on appropriating Jewish history to the Arabs uh, living in the land of Israel and to then transforming the Jews who have been robbed of their history and of their culture, and of their uniqueness, and of their rights, which have been seized by the Arabs of the land of Israel, who call themselves the Palestinians, um, is that they've transformed the Jews into the, 
the anti-Semites. That is, the, the, the new Jews are the Palestinians who have seized Jewish identity for, for themselves, Jewish history, our ties to the land of Israel, our rights to the land of Israel, our history in the land of Israel, and our history as a nation. They've attributed it to themselves. They've transformed us into colonialist interlopers and the villains of our own history, the villains of our own story. And um, and by doing so, they have legitimized the cause of Israel's annihilation. So that whether it's in whether it's in in uh, the streets of Berlin or on the campuses of the major universities in the United States, where death to the Jews is called, I mean, we saw um, people calling for the annihilation of Israel marching through the streets of University of Michigan campus or the the quads of University of Michigan campus. I think it was during the high holy uh, high holy uh, 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 days uh, earlier this year. So 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 we're seeing this phenomenon repeated throughout the Western world, where because of the acceptance of Palestinian appropriation of Jewish identity, we see a legitimization of the cause of the annihilation of the Jewish state and the erasure from polite society, the vanishing from polite society of Jews who are identified or identify with the state of Israel, the Jewish state. Um, and no, this doesn't involve jackboots. This doesn't involve uh, uh, cattle cars and Auschwitz. This is not a reenactment of what we saw 80 years ago in, in Europe, but this is a new um, iteration of the age-old tale of anti-Semitism being uh, characterized by a desire, a willingness to accept the legitimacy of the annihilation of Jews, the annihilation of the Jewish people, the 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 banishing from uh, from the public square of Jews as Jews, um, and the permission the 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 granting of permission for Jews to enter polite society, but not, not as um, Zionists, not as religious Jews, um, not as easily identifiable Jews uh, um, any longer. And uh, we have blinded ourselves to the implication of this, the left in Israel, has embraced this narrative of what lesson we're supposed to learn from the Holocaust that basically says that anybody can be a Nazi, including us. And in fact, uh, Yair Lapid, opposition leader Yair Lapid, said at a, in his remarks at uh, Erev Yom HaShoah uh, ceremony this uh, evening, that uh, the lesson that we take from the Holocaust is that we have to be moral in order, in, in other words, what he's saying, the head of the opposition uh, in in the Knesset is saying that our lesson from the Holocaust is that we're not allowed to be Nazis. But that, of course, is, is obscene. I mean, there's nothing in Jewish history, there's nothing in the behavior of Israel, there's nothing in the behavior of Jews anywhere that would ever lend anybody... Um, a basis uh, for claiming that Jews would ever become Nazis. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that was killed by postmodernism is, is the understanding that nations develop over time and that they have a collective identity that's based on a common history. Um, because uh, postmodern conceptualization of humanity is that we're basically all atoms and that everything's arbitrary and that what happens to me can happen to you. It's all relative. And not only is cultural relativism part of postmodernism, but the but people are taken out of their historical cultural context. And 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 therefore you can't understand the distinctiveness of one nation from another. Why it is that it was the Germans that carried out the Holocaust and not the Russians, not the French, not the British, not the Jews 
not the not not the Americans, etc. There were aspects of German culture that uh, developed and grew over hundreds of years um, that involved an acceptance to the point of an unconscious acceptance of the notion that Jews are subhuman, that Jews are animals, that Jews are beneath the German Volk. Um, and then you add to that the scientific advancement of German society um, and, um, and other aspects of German national character as it developed over hundreds of years of German history. And you get to Wagner and you get to the anti-Semitism leagues and you get to the Green Mo Movement from which uh, the Nazi movement arose. Um, and you see that while well, the Nazis started out as a minority of Germans, and even in 1932, they got less votes apparently than they got in the previous elections, um, their development was not alien to German society. To the contrary, it was organic to German society. And so, you know, you ignore that. And then you can say anybody can be a Nazi. Well, no. Now, can anybody be evil? Sure, anybody can be evil. But the idea that the main lesson that Jews have to take from the Holocaust is that we can't be evil is reducing us to, to nothing, is ignoring then how Jewish culture, tradition, heritage has grown up not over hundreds of years, but over thousands of years. And you atomize Jews to the point that anybody can be anything. I can wake up in the morning and become anything. And obviously you can connect this to all kinds of progressive conceptualizations of um, human agency or lack thereof, depending on whether you have agency to um, be transgender or you have agency uh, uh, to reject transgenderism. Well, no, you can do the former, but you can't do the latter, of course, but that's neither here nor there. But I mean, the idea that, that, um, that Lapid is putting forward is taking away everything that we are, all of the heritage that we've inherited from our parents and our grandparents, and we transfer, we transfer to our children and to our posterity um, and reducing us to just bare bones nothings that can be swayed in any direction. And of course, the, the lesson of the Holocaust really for Jews is that we can't be victims, that we have to be strong. And the difference between where we are today in 2023 and where we were at the ghetto uh, in Warsaw and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising 80 years ago in 1943 is that um, they had the fighting spirit and they had the willingness to sacrifice their lives for their people. Um, and they believed in the uh, rebuilding of the Jewish state, which is why they foisted the blue and white flag with a, with a Magin David, with the Star of David, over the, their bunker on Mila Street in, in the Warsaw Ghetto um, as, as they were as they were fighting the most miraculous fight in Poland, really, of the entire war. I mean, they lasted longer than the Polish army did. Um, but they didn't have the firepower. They didn't have sovereignty. They didn't have tanks. They didn't really even have guns. They didn't have anything. And they weren't free. And the difference between them and the IDF and Israel is that we have a country and that we're strong. And our great challenge, and I'm going to talk about it with my guest, uh, Tony Badran, when we talk, we change gears completely and we move to the issue of what's happening in Lebanon and the onslaught that Israel has been uh, absorbing um, over the past couple of weeks of missile attacks and terrorist attacks from Lebanon emanating, originating, or being you know, uh, in, um, ordered by Iran and the Revolutionary Guard Corps. Kutz Force commander who's been in Lebanon uh, and coordinating with Hezbollah, Hamas, and other terrorist organizations uh, to all attack Israel simultaneously. Um, 
So we're going to talk about that. So Israel's main challenge today is can we stand up to Iran and can are we really going to do something to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear armed regional hegemon or not? And that's the great test that we face today. But the concept that the Jews could be in a situation where we would have this kind of great test facing us, where we would have to ask the question, are we powerful enough to take the action that we need to take in order to secure our place in the region and and our continued existence here um, is something that the men and women fighting in the Warsaw Ghetto 80 years ago would ne- could never even dreamed of, of achieving in their lifetimes. Um, but it was what they saw. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be what they became, which was an inspiration for generations upon generations of Jews in Israel that we hear their war cry, which is Jews be strong. Don't be victims. Don't allow this to happen. Never again means something. But again, we go back to Berlin of this week, where again, there were people marching through the streets of Berlin, just as they're marching through campuses throughout the United States and Europe, calling for the annihilation of the Jewish state. And in Germany, very picturesquely, also called for the death to the Jews. And The confusion of the Jews, the left in Israel, and the liberal Jewish establishment in the United States that simply doesn't recognize that the Palestinian narrative, which they want to accept because they want to believe that peace is possible between Israel and a national movement that defines itself by negating Israel's right to exist, is possible. And when they accepted the two-state narrative, the paradigm of two states, they didn't recognize that what they were actually doing was accepting the blame and the guilt and the responsibility for the absence of peace in the Middle East and accepting the notion that it was Israel's fault because that's sort of the entry point to the Palestinian narrative. Um, And they didn't mean to sign on to the, uh, the whole narrative, which negates Israel's right to exist. It negates Jewish peoplehood and it negates their right, whether as Israeli Jews or as diaspora Jews, to feel any affinity towards their fellow Jews as members of a distinct nation called the Jewish nation. But that's, in fact, what they signed up for. And so they've become very confused because they didn't realize that when they were in in for an inch on supporting the Palestinian narrative against Israel, they were actually in for a mile. And so now we see a situation where Jews who strive for a strong Israel living at peace with its neighbors have suddenly been paralyzed and hamstrung by the Palestinian narrative to the point where not only can't they defend Israel adequately any longer, they can't defend themselves against anti-Semitism, which is literally pushing them out of all the enclaves of American society or British society or French society that they have uh, come over the past several decades, particularly since World War II, to feel most at home. And so, you know, I'm just going to give you some examples. In late February, if you haven't read it yet, you really should look up a very, very important article that was published in Public Magazine by Jacob Savage in late February called The Vanishing. And in The Vanishing, Savage goes through all of the areas of American society that Jews under, um, in previous generations, up until really uh, the 21st centuries, were always most prominent. And now they've, they've simply been blotted out in many cases. And so, for instance, I don't know whether this was his data or, or, or a different article, um, But, you know, in 2000, um, 20 percent of the students in the Ivy League schools were Jews. And today it's only seven and it's going down. Um, You have Jews are almost not not present in New York State's uh, congressional delegation. Um, There used to be 20 Jews in the congressional delegation in New York uh, City Council. Same thing. Jews are being wiped out. I saw an article last week that said that the last Jew, uh, that that the last Jewish professors at City University of New York are being pushed out. And not only are they being pushed out, they're being replaced by anti-Semites. 
um, screenwriters in Hollywood no longer Jewish. Um, academia again, you know, four uh, percent of 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 top academics under thirty today are Jewish. In the baby boomer generation, twenty one percent were. Um, so I mean, anywhere you turn, uh, Savage has museum boards. Apparently, Jews used to make up a very large percentage of members of museum boards. Now they're all being pushed out, and they're being pushed out in a wave of anti semitism. You saw this at the Whitney Museum, for instance. A member of the board of trustees was pushed out because his con his company sells, I don't know, dual use equipment or military equipment, not quite sure, who cares, uh, to Israel. Um, and this suddenly makes him an animal and he can't be part of the Whitney Board of Trustees. And and there's, because Jews either are cowards, which I think is probably true in some cases and in other cases, in many cases, because they've been confused by this two-state narrative. They simply can't understand that what we're facing today whether here in Israel with Palestinian terrorism or abroad in this demonization and, and delegitimization of Israel and legitimization of the murder of Jews in Israel um, by the Palestinians and their supporters in the progressive left, it, 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 Jews are being denied their basic civil rights, their basic rights to be members of their own societies. Um, and instead of fighting back against this, um, the, the Jewish leaders in, in, in the United States and in, and in other Western uh, countries are, are making excuses or turning on Israel and ending their association with, is, with the Jews as a nation and instead accepting the atomization of their own identity and saying that being a Jew doesn't mean being part of a nation. I mean, you have, and, and, and this isn't going to work. It's not going to work for the individual Jews who are trying to do it. It's not going to work for the Jewish communities in the diaspora, and it's not going to work here in Israel. Um, we, we came away from the Holocaust with the slogan of never again. But I don't think that when this concept of never again was first conceived, that people were deluding themselves into thinking that specifically the horrors, the unique horrors that Jews of Europe suffered as a result of the Nazi machine that, that the German people embraced and then export it throughout Europe uh, and receive the collaboration of many, many of the countries that fell under uh, their control. Um, I don't think that the people who, who coined the phrase never again thought that that specific, unique circumstance was liable to repeat itself. I, I think that they probably believed, and certainly today we should understand, that never again doesn't refer only to uh, the Nazi Holocaust. It it refers to Jewish powerlessness, and it refers to an acceptance of the notion that there's something inherently, intrinsically wrong with Jews, either as individuals or as a collective, and that standing up for Jews means standing up and against those concepts. And if we don't do these things, either as individuals or as communities or as a country in Israel's case, then it will happen ever again. Again, we'll go back to a situation where not only are people in every generation seeking to annihilate the Jews, but as happened uh, four generations ago, 80 years ago, um, it will happen. It will happen. So the lesson that I take from the Holocaust and the lesson that I believe that all Jews should take is that the answer to anti-Semitism is not Jewish morality. Jews are more. 
by and large, obviously we have uh, we have criminals just like any other uh, society and people do. There are good people and there are Bernie Madoffs, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's not the lesson, though, from the Holocaust. The lesson from the Holocaust is to be powerful and to stand up for yourself and to not stand by and accept it when people start denying the rights of the Jews in a way that they do to no other country. Um, so those are my thoughts. And uh, now I want to turn to my interview with uh, Tony Bedran, as I call him, my resident expert on, on Lebanon and the Carolyn Glick Show. Um, and it's changing gears, but I think we're also here going to be talking about, we are talking about uh, an existential threat to Israel and how are we going to handle it? What what are the stakes and, and how how is Israel supposed to be moving forward as Iran grows in power and its proxies uh, in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, Gaza, increasingly Judea and Samaria, uh, start taking orders from Tehran uh, to act in coordinated assault against Israel as Iran starts chassaying across the uh, nuclear finish line. So uh, without further ado, let's move to uh, that uh, interview. And, and don't forget, uh, Jewish power is good. <laughs> it's very good. And we should seek as much as of, of it as we possibly can, because um, that that's how you fight anti-Semitism. All right, let's move on. Okay, well, once again, as promised, we're here with uh, Tony Bedron from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He's been here before. He's our resident expert on all things related to Lebanon and Hezbollah on the Carolyn Glick Show. So we've had a lot going on in Lebanon, and who can we talk to other than our resident expert, which would be Tony Bedron. So again, thanks so much for being on the Carolyn Glick Show, Tony. Thank you, Carolyn. It's great to be back with you. All right. Well, listen. Um, so we've. I, I want to just kind of frame this for a second to try to understand how we're supposed to look at the attacks from Hamas, Hezbollah's uh, statements by Hassan Nasrallah, Hezbollah leader, um, and a lot of other things that we'll talk about in a second. But I'm wondering if you would agree that one of the things that's really made the situation as incendiary as it seems to be, that we're facing a multi-front war being waged by Iran through its various proxies, um, is uh, the statement by President Joe Biden two weeks ago, where he effectively said that uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, is persona non grata in Washington. I mean, how do you, he, he said that he has no plan to meet with uh, Netanyahu. He talked to him as if he were some local Democratic committee, uh, you know, committee man in some uh, podunk uh, county in the middle of a big blue state, um, just dismissed him, attacked him for his government's efforts to reform the judiciary, which is an absolutely internal Israeli affair. Um, and then he said he wasn't going to meet with him. Um, how how did that play out in the region? How do you think that uh, Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah and his people saw it? How did they how did they view that in Iran? How, how do you look at that first of all? Sure. Well, I mean, we have a precedent, right? So this is not uh, what happened now did not happen in a vacuum. Uh, there is a precedent for it, um, and the precedent was just two years ago, uh, almost around exactly the same time. Um, so May twenty twenty one. Uh, which was the first time we had had a major conflagration between Israel and uh, the Palestinians, specifically in Gaza, uh, which also then extended beyond the Israeli-Palestinian arena to include other fronts. Uh, and we had a framing for that war. And the framing for that war was not the gibberish that was that was printed in the media about uh, you know, remember back then it was the Sheikh Jarrah incident and the evictions and all of that. And everyone said, well, you know, this is uh, something that has uh, led to a pan-Palestinian uprising because the, you know, Palestinian honor could not tolerate these things and, and so on and so forth. Well, that's We're just We're talking nonsense. about the, the violence or the, the, the conditions that uh, preceded Hamas's uh, 
missile assault on right. Israel and the Israeli Arab attack on Israeli Jews in Correct. what became known as Guardian of the Walls. Correct. This is before the the, what, the lead up to Guardian of the Walls, uh, or as the as Hamas and the Iranian Axis called it, the Sword of Jerusalem. And the emphasis of Jerusalem again is not uh, coincidental or haphazard. We'll we'll get to that in a second. But anyway, the 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 framing of that is not what this little neat storyline that the media put out uh, is. This, the framing of the story came from Iran, and it came about four days before the rocket salvo starting, uh, started uh, from, from Gaza. And it came from uh, the supreme leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei. And he uh, talked about it in, uh, very specifically in terms of an, an end to Israeli-Arab normalization, and B, uh, uh, he made a very interesting comment. Uh, the balance of power, he says, uh, has swung. You know, so it, it has shifted. Why did uh, Ali Khamenei all of a sudden uh, say that the balance of power has shifted in the region against the Israeli Arab rapprochement and, and so on? Uh, what had happened a few months prior was that there was a change in power in Washington with an administration that came into power that was explicitly hostile to the Abraham Accords and explicitly uh, 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 gung-ho about uh, reaching an agreement and a rapprochement with the Iranians. Okay, That's the context in which all of this happened. So when we talk about it today, we don't have to speculate, right? This is a continuation. And there is a straight line, incidentally, of other incidents through the uh, maritime agreement that we saw a year after um, the uh, Guardian of the Walls to today. So like at every, uh, at one, in one year intervals, you had very specific stops uh, leading to this moment. And they are all uh, fixated on the uh, dynamics in Washington, which very strangely uh, converge with Iranian uh, uh, preferences and priorities uh, uh, when it comes to Israel and, and the broader Arab world. So that's pretty disturbing. So you're saying that essentially it, the way that you see it now is that there's this quasi- this informal, this uh, unspoken agreement, this gentleman's agreement between the Iranians and the Americans um, that, that squeezes Israel, that essentially says that Israel is now, um, it's, it's open season. Like you can, you can uh, shoot missiles into Israel. Uh, Iranian proxies can attack Israel in various ways and um and and America won't have Israel's back is that is that essentially what you're saying that that's how Iran uh, that's how Iran is is interpreting um uh Washington's posture today in the region I think that's certainly how Iran is is interpreting it I think that there's a shared interest in uh squeezing um uh, a an undesired an undesirable uh, uh, leadership in uh, in uh, Israel, which, as you noted, you know the administration has made plain that they don't like this coalition. Uh, they their historic dislike of Netanyahu goes back to the Obama days, anyway. Uh, but right, uh, but don't forget, I mean, like what happened last year, last year's uh, iteration of this exercise, as you noted, I mean that was with lapid that was with the government that they did like on the right. eve of the elections right so well, yes but, they, but, but they, what's interesting with that is okay so this is where the convergence really happens so uh, so let's let's back up a little bit so we we talked about um this administration coming in with explicit hostility towards the uh, abraham accord framework right uh they did not like the premise of the abraham accord the abraham accords premise is not another peace process right minus the palestinians the abraham accords uh, 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 uh substance was about uh, america uh, drawing a line in the sand on one side of it is america's camp of regional allies that are now brought together uh, and then on the other side is America's adversaries and the revisionist powers 
specifically the Iranians. This was a direct um, a challenge or rejection of the Obama realignment JCPOA framework, where we dump American allies or degrade, downgrade American allies, and we upgrade uh, Iranian interests, and we shove it down the throat of all of America's allies throughout the region, you know, with share the neighborhood, uh, respect Iranian equities. All of these are utterings by the former president, Barack Obama, about Iran, which is really remarkable. Um, so we, America is openly declaring its respect of Iranian equities, a euphemism for Iranian subversion throughout the, uh, the Levant and the Arab world. Um, uh, uh, so that, that is, um, um, the, 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 this is what the framework that they came with and what the Abraham Accord framework was rejecting. Then they started to re, uh, sort of to, to hollow out, they started using the, the nomenclature, the, the Abraham, Accords, Abraham Accords terminology, which in, initially they had rejected. Uh, almost pathologically, actually. And then they started saying it, but then they started redefining it. So they started saying Abraham Accords and Normalization Agreement. So they don't say it by itself, right? Um, and, and by the way, normalization is the same word that Khamenei and Hezbollah uses, right? Which is a, a, a lower level word, right? And it, it, it carries yeah, but it was baggage also that the they, got, they, they gutted the Abraham Accords. I mean, you know, and and this is something yeah. that I want to uh, uh, move on to in a bit. But, but just yet, but just, just, just sort of one, as a, as well, a just curtain, one but, but let me just say one just thing. One second. So they just they just put in the Palestinians right. in it too. There was a very exactly that's what I was going to say. Right. They so they gutted it by putting the, in the Palestinians and the Jordanians. Yes. They also tried to put in absolutely. So they used that's what you saw with the Aqaba summit. That's what you saw with the Sharm el Sheikh thing. So. And the, with the Negev the, summit, they tried to do it. The, sorry, they, the, the Negev summit, I meant. Yes, that's the... Uh, so the, the idea was that you you put in the veneer of the Abraham Accords. You bring in the Gulf Arab states and whatever. But the core of what it is that you're talking about then recenters back against around the Palestinians and brings back the actors like Jordan and uh, right. Egypt to a certain... Uh, to a lesser degree that were kind of cast aside... Uh, with the Abraham Accords, which shifted the, the focus back toward the Gulf. So, um, right, so wait, let uh, me so just then, give the yeah. curtain raiser. Let me just give the teaser that I want to talk about uh, after we finish this one discussion, which is that, of course, the Abraham Accords were uh, a U.S. takeover of an already existing alliance or working relationship that Israel had forged with the Saudis and the UAEs and the UAE during the Obama years to protect themselves from the Obama administration's turn against them and towards Tehran. So that you know, the question was always whether, you know, America was a Johnny come lately in this relationship that really began, I would say, with the with the uh, overthrow of the Morsi regime. Um, and um, and then and then they came in, took it over. And the question is whether these relationship these relationships can be maintained now that the United States is turning away. But before we get to that, I just want to go back for a second to what's happening now in, in, in Lebanon. So we have the situation where you had an American and Iranian wink, wink, nod, nod kind of thing about where America stands vis-a-vis -vis Israel that then led the, that empowers Iran against Israel. So then what we, what we saw, I think, was it two weeks ago already we had, uh, um, uh, Kahani, the head of the El Quds force in the IRGC, lands in Beirut. He holds meetings with Nasrallah and Hamas leaders, uh, Samir Aruri, who lives in in Beirut, and um, and Ismail Haniya, who came in from their, uh, Qatar, the ally of Iran and Lebanon, for this summit at the Iranian uh, embassy. And then we start having these Hamas missile attacks on Israel. So what was that about? Why did they decide to attack Israel now? Like right. what what are, what are they thinking about here? So um, um just, let's also just finish the thought about because you started with the um what happened with the maritime as an as an interval between those oh, two I things. I totally and, forgot. Gee, look what a terrible yeah, I'm no, sorry guys, I'm a terrible moderator. You know, too much no, stuff going on that, here. 
So we'll go back to the maritime and then we'll go to the second. No, no, because it's it's a trajectory that leads to the same place, right? So you're asking why, what the difference was between the American posture toward that. So as part of the gutting of and redefinition of the Abraham Accords, the administration came up with, with, with a phrase called regional integration, that it's promoting regional integration. Now, the, the example, and, and the maritime deal, by the way, was sold very publicly and very prominently as a uh, uh, the feature of this kind of regional integration uh, paradigm. And what are the other uh, uh, examples? The other examples they gave all involved Iranian uh, uh, satrapies, Yemen and Iraq. So, so these guys are talking about regional integration and everyone is supposed to think, oh, they're talking about Arab-Israeli integration. But then you read their examples, all their examples are Arab-Iranian integration, right? Uh, or, or rapprochement that benefits Iran and, ben and basically includes Arab investment in Iranian holdings. And then the maritime agreement comes. And the maritime agreement basically is an Iranian-Israeli integration, effectively, right? That was the point. The point is not... So it orients both the Arabs and the Israelis towards Iran. Your job is not to come together against Iran. Your job is to integrate yourself with Iran. And that was why they pushed hard. Uh, so it's uh, actually Latin. Iran that's being integrated, not Israel, against Correct. Israel. Correct. And Israel is Correct. supposed to embrace this, this paradigm, which is designed to annihilate it. That's why they amplified Hezbollah's missile and drone threat against the Karish platform in Israel in the summer, right after, which came, not coincidentally, the day after the rotation happened in the prime ministership and Lapid takes over. Lapid takes over, the next day this thing happens. And then uh, Amos Hochstein comes to Israel and instead of saying, okay, look, we don't negotiate with a gun to our heads and et cetera, he says, no, this creates a sense of urgency. You need to sign it now. And, I, and, and the president wants it done within two months at the latest, because that's also the timetable that Hezbollah said, that if Karish goes online, all bets are off and so on and so forth. So America took Hezbollah's threat and amplified it to, to get uh, an outgoing minority caretaker government in the last three months, four months of its tenure to sign a deal with an Iranian equity to the benefit of an Iranian equity, right? So you're asking about the perception in Iran vis-a-vis -vis Washington. That was the second interval. Then comes the third interval, the third interval, which is now, which is a repetition of the first because it's the same context. It's the same timing. Uh, could stay... Um, uh, uh, Jerusalem-focused stuff, Ramadan-focused stuff, so the timing works well. So they went back to the same exact uh, method, which is to use, uh, because Hezbollah uh, and Israel have since effectively 2013, let's draw it at that, so a good decade, that's, that's a nice and neat uh, timeline, uh, but it actually ha happens to be true, right? Since 2013, Israel, by and large, has refrained from hitting inside Lebanon. There are exceptions. Uh, it starts with 2013 when they hit a major uh, uh, senior, very senior, assassinated a very senior uh, Hezbollah drone and, and sort of technology uh, uh, official. There was another interval in 2019 when there was a piece of machinery uh, in the heart of uh, Beirut, Hezbollah's uh, neighborhoods that was used uh, for um, upgrading, uh, for, for, for precision uh, missile manufacture, okay? And they hit it with a drone, and it was a very calculated and very uh, careful operation, precisely because they did not want major strikes in, in to, to upset. So in that decade, Israel has abstained from major operations in Lebanon, preferring instead to carry out the uh, operations in Syria, to try to degrade capabilities that were en route to Lebanon on the one hand, but also to, to deny Iran the ability to um, 
create infrastructure in Syria itself to add yet another front that can be used um, uh, against against it. Now, I heard, this has by been the way, successful. can I just ask a, an informational question in mm -hmm. the middle? I heard that now that Israel has, you know, been attacking the Damascus airport in broad daylight, allegedly, that uh, Iran said, fine, you, you attack in Damascus, um, but you're not attacking in Beirut, so that now they're just moving material directly to Hezbollah through the Beirut airport. Uh, did you did you hear that as well? I mean, are, are they starting to move shipments directly to Beirut? I think they've been moving parts to, through Beirut for for a long time. So I don't think uh, that's... You don't think uh, it's a new... Okay. No. All right, so you go, go back, back to, to 2000, where you were. Yeah. There's already stories in 2018. You remember Netanyahu even made this big presentation about the Beirut airport, uh, what was it, 2019, I think maybe it was, I don't remember. Anyway, but it, it, so this is not necessarily new information. Of course, the, the bigger material comes uh, from Syria. And by the way, the bigger material comes also by land. Uh, so like you can disperse it in trucks and send it down. From Iraq. Um, from Iraq, uh, but also, you know, when, when they land in Syria, in w whichever of the airports, then you, you know, put them in trucks and then you, you ship them overland and much more difficult to hit because if you want to hit them, you have to hit them on the Syrian side because the IDF has accepted Hezbollah's rules of engagement. We don't hit in Lebanon because if we hit in Lebanon, then there's retaliation and then that could lead to war and we don't want that at this moment, right? So this equation works to the benefit of Hezbollah and then for the last, uh, let's say, five, six years, Hezbollah has been trying to take advantage of it and expand it. Right. If Hezbollah has created de facto deterrence in Lebanon, it wants to take the umbrella of this deterrence, which, by the way, is now amplified by the United States. Every time there's American investment in Lebanon, that makes it that adds to the constraints on Israeli action in Lebanon, because now now this a lot of American investments like, no, you're not allowed to hit that. You, you can jeopardize that. That's what the maritime agreement was explicitly sold as. Uh, mutual deterrence, the more investments there are in, in, in uh, Lebanon, European and American, uh, the more security there is for Lebanon because then Israel can't hit back. And then some really not very bright Israelis started saying, well, that's a great thing because now Hezbollah can't hit. Uh, well, you know, if they hit us, you know, we'll hit their their offshore rig, which is, which is ridiculous. No Israeli uh, leader is going to hit is going to hit a French operated and uh, um, a gas rig or whatever. So that's just nonsense. Anyway, but the point of it was precisely to add this, to add to this deterrence over Lebanon or protective umbrella over Lebanon. So Hezbollah started saying, okay, look, if you're hitting us in Syria, here's the thing. If any Hezbollah operative dies in Syria, we, re we retaliate from Lebanon, right? So then the risk of war happens again. Now, and then they expanded it further. Uh, if you now we have Hamas, quote unquote, or Palestinian factions, quote unquote, firing from Lebanon. If you hit back in Lebanon, we'll hit you. Uh, or we are going now to decide the modalities of what you can hit and what you can't hit and what our response will be tailored to each of your strikes and so on and so forth. So they're dragging the IDF into this modus operandi, which resembles really the op modus operandi of 1996 with the April understanding, for those who remember, which is basically when uh, Hezbollah, um, uh, with Washington uh, and French uh, in, uh, mediation via Syria at the time, uh, set new rules uh, or, uh, you know, uh, recognized. That was when that Barack was the uh, chief of staff of the army or, or no, he was a defense minister under Paris uh, after Rabin was assassinated, and it was right. the Grapes of Wrath operation, right? right? And so that's right. That's as, right. as a result of that operation, basically Israel agreed to kind of recede back into these fortresses in the security zone in, in Lebanon and ceded all of the open areas to Hezbollah, more or less, right? Is, is that well, I mean, it was, it was basically... It basically forced on Israel this idea of proportionate response, right? Like, so if there are, um, uh, the, the, how Is you that hit when we had the, I, the, 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 the fake massacre in Kafir Kana? Was that the first Kana, time when they said that? 
Right, with the UN, where the UN area was hit, and, and there was, uh, yeah, people were, were uh, yes, that's right. So, um, uh, but but the point of it is that it allowed, from Hezbollah's point of view, that it can hit from Lebanon, it can launch operations from Lebanon, and Israel's retaliation will be these pinprick strike against launching uh, platforms which are in the middle of fields nowhere and nobody cares. So it didn't carry a uh, uh, a price really for Hezbollah. Unlike what ended up happening, let's say in 2006, regardless of what one thinks of that war and how it was botched or not, uh, the the scale of the retaliation and the destruction that was visited on Hezbollah and Lebanon generally, more generally, uh, uh, is was a, was a qualitative leap from what has happened in 96. So obviously Hezbollah's interest is to retain its maneuverability the way it did in 96 without having to pay the price. So now the IDF with this new Hamas and Palestinian faction stuff operating in Lebanon, it, the IDF is, is basically conceding uh, a little bit of that uh, to, to Hezbollah. Um, and they were selling for a while a really ridiculous talking point that uh, that somehow Hamas not only was acting independently of Hezbollah, but somehow it was acting against the interests of Hezbollah, that it was trying to drag Hezbollah into war. This is all gibberish. Even though, uh, even though the heads of Hamas met with Nasrallah, and with uh, Kahani, the Iranian general, at the Iranian embassy before they started attacking? They, that... uh, incident, inc- yes, I mean, incidentally, that was this meeting with Ghani and, and Hezbollah and the Palestinian factions, that's not new. That happened. The exact same thing happened in 21. Exactly. The exact same thing. That's why I said it's a repeat of that. Uh, in fact, they were boasting at the time about... Uh, um, uh, a joint operations room because they wanted the idea that this is under our uh, aegis and that this is Iranian Hezbollah uh, uh, orientation towards the Palestinians against, as a paradigm, against the normalization agreement using their language. Nasrallah used it at the time in 21. Khamenei set the tone for it. And all the Palestinian leaders who announced it, announced it from Tehran, right? You can see a lot of these guys, like Muhammad al-Daif, for instance, the Hamas military leader. He was in Tehran when he announced all of these, thanking the Iranians for the capabilities that were given to Gaza and so on. So, um, so they want that uh, to be to be known. They want it to be announced, right? Um, and they are, and then they they you know, there is this game where they're saying, well, we. We're not saying we're responsible. We're not saying we're not responsible for these attacks. That's, you know, for the Israelis to, to figure out. But the deterrence equation remains. If you guys hit in Lebanon, if you assassinate Palestinian officials in Lebanon, etc., we will retaliate. And then we go back to this dance that the IDF has locked itself in by agreeing to these rules uh, with, with, with Hezbollah. So this is so, the trajectory, the like I said. We- one of the things that, you know, is really distressing and worrying a lot of Israelis today is the massive, massive quantity of missiles that Hezbollah now has aimed at Israel. And the assessments are that if Hezbollah opened a war with Israel, if they responded um the basis of their capabilities today, that we would just be smashed, that that the destructive power of a prolonged missile onslaught that would see 4,000, 5,000 missiles shot at Israel every day for weeks, because that's their capacity, a lot of them precision guided against our airfields, against our other strategic uh, sites, that that would be the equivalent of of a nuclear assault on Israel in terms of its destructive power. So I think you know, and and it would obviously overwhelm our our missile, our anti missile uh, uh, capabilities fairly quickly. When you add to that the depletion of American uh, weapon stores, whether it's artillery shells or you know Hellfire missiles, whether it's um, you know Iron Dome missiles, which we don't have automatic uh, 
resupply anyway, as we saw with uh, Congress's refusal to expand the replenishment of our missiles after Guardian of the Walls. I think we just had another 14 anti-Israel Democrats sign a letter to Biden saying over the weekend, I saw a report saying, we want you to stop mm -hmm. uh, giving military assistance to Israel. So when you when you put that in as well, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, Israel is to turn because um, they have developed a capability that Israel doesn't have an easy answer to unless, of course, we throw away the rule book that we acceded to in 1996 in terms of a, a proportionate response and actually use our comparative advantage as a conventional military power against against Lebanon in a profound way. Um, and I don't see any willingness among members of the general staff to do that. So, But I mean, I, I, I'm just speculating, but there's certainly a lot of talk about that in Israel that we simply never... We never put together a, a comprehensive or credible response to the missile threat from, from Hezbollah. And that's why they continue to pretend that they don't know what's happening. Right. So there, there are there are two things, right? So there there is, you know, school uh, two schools of thought, right? So there is an argument to be made uh, that, look, uh, we'd rather focus on building up the, cap the capabilities to hit the Iranians. And then we will deal, if there's a response from Lebanon, we will deal with that afterwards. But we don't want to spend our capabilities first on a very destructive war, which could uh, uh, diminish our ability to take action against. So that assumes, of course, that there's action that's forthcoming on, on the Iranians. So that's a line of thought, and it's a legitimate. So I'm not, I'm not here, I'm not here to... Um, you know, to pass judgment over it, but but you have to kind of lay out the pros of, and cons of of the policy. And so the policy, th th there was a temptation with the success of the precision strikes in Syria, uh, the cost-free precision strikes in Syria uh, over the last decade. Um, that we lost one F sixteen. We lost one. Right. Right, so over a, over over a decade, right, and that's only after uh, the Russian intervention and and so on. So this is, um, but in terms of it leading to a conflagration, let's say with Hezbollah, it's or, or with any other Iranian asset, it's been uh, it's been very uh, cost effective in that sense. The problem with it is that, of course, um, it leads to a, a false sense of. Uh, or as like an alternative that somehow we're doing this and therefore we are actually we don't have successful to do in Lebanon. It's not clear that that's the case because very obviously they are building capabilities and they are upgrading their missiles. Um, obviously, you know, the number of, of uh, uh, I mean, the, generally the number of precision missiles is set is set to be Obviously, lower than the dumb missiles and rockets, which of course is true. Not that the, not that those don't have a destructive uh, capability as well, or uh, ability to overwhelm the defense system. But uh, the destruction, and, and then you add the UAVs, and then you add the multiple fronts, uh, and then all of a sudden you have your, a very serious uh, uh, situation. So there's no there's no question about that. There is no question about the seriousness. But that in in itself is a testament to failure. Then. then if the idea of, of denying Hezbollah the ability to have uh, first strike capability, that was the whole point, right? Like if we, need, if we need to strike the Iranians, we have to make sure to deny Hezbollah first strike capability uh, or just in general as a strategic threat, right? Uh, well, if, if that's the case, then, then that policy has failed, right? Even if the developments in Syria has, have led to new challenges that you had to address and you've maybe succeeded in fending those challenges off, that may be the case. So I'm not like giving them a hard time or anything, but but reality is reality. That's what you have now in the situation. So um, how do you deal with that? And 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 if you continue to push it, to push, the, to kick that can down the road, uh, as you have been, like I say, for the last 10 years, um, does it get better or does it get worse? Uh, does it get better when America decides to realign with Iran there was a school of thought which I thought. I mean, at the time I attacked it, and and I and I and I've been borne out by events. Which was uh, Moshe alone said, "Oh, you know those missiles? They're just going to rust. 
you know, so we already saw in 2006 and subsequently what what a what a ridiculous statement that was. I mean, they have WD-40 in what Lebanon, I guess. But um, the the other thing is just that, um, you know, we we have to. It, why wouldn't they attack us simultaneously? I mean, they've shown even in 2006, preceding that war, was a two week offensive from Gaza. Right. So they were already doing a coordinated attack in 2006. We had Gilad Shalit was a, was kidnapped. His tank crew was killed in that uh, subterranean tunnel attack inside of uh, Israel by Karen Shalom uh, in 2006 in June, in late June. And then, you know, 10 days later, they attacked the IDF position along the border with Lebanon. Along the same line, stole the two bodies of uh, Goldwasser and Regev that they killed in that attack. So. You had you had this coordinated two front assault in 2006, and they've con they've continued to coordinate and act in tandem since then, and yet we still have Israeli generals promoting this fiction that Hezbollah and Hamas are not coordinated, that Hamas is operating independently, even when we see so they obviously know this. They're obviously not retarded. I mean, you know, stupid. They they understand that they're lying, and then the question becomes: So why are they, why are they putting out these fictions? Why are they, why are they doing that? And and let me just add one more thing to that, which is, you know, even now, right? Um, over the past week, we've had this discussion in Israel, which I find problematic, and I think it's sourced to the same root, which is that. Um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu gave an interview uh, last Thursday where he said that we didn't only strike back, that when our strike, our retaliatory strike in Lebanon was not merely an airstrike, that there was other special operation stuff going on. And the fact that Hezbollah didn't respond to whatever it was that uh, Israel did, and that has since been, you know, uh, borne out by, you know, three other uh, security sources who say, you know, that this is absolutely true, but that Israel, whatever operation we carried out against Hezbollah, apparently in Lebanon, was enough to prevent Nasrallah from, from, from attacking Israel in response to that. So then the question becomes, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that we now think that we have deterrence? Does, is, is something this small? I mean, we don't know, maybe it's huge. I don't have, I have no idea, you know, but could just one thing, like whatever it happened to have been, mean that Israel does have deterrence? I mean, what is deterrence? Like, I mean, how how are we even supposed to look at this entire discussion? Is this claim that they we deterred them from responding important? And if it isn't, you know, what is it? Right. I mean, so uh, I guess we'll we'll find out if if uh, Nasalla is deterred based on whether there is repetition down the road of, of the kind of attacks. Remember, the, the missile attacks uh, or the rocket attacks that happened from Lebanon, uh, uh, the 34 rockets, were preceded by a very interesting operation, right, in the on the Megiddo Junction, which came from right. Lebanon as well. 80 so kilometers now, inside of Israeli territory. Correct. So you had someone who was brought in from Lebanon, however he was brought in from Lebanon, and there are, you know, different scenarios for how that would have happened. But the point is, this is someone that came, and they wanted to wanted it to be known that it, it's someone. Sorry, that it's someone that came from Lebanon, um, and so um, that was obviously something very new uh, in terms of the rules of engagement of the last whatever twenty years uh, or so. Um, so if there is more of those things, then obviously. Um, Hezbollah's uh, um, confidence in Israel's reluctance to mount operations in Lebanon, and therefore that its deterrence equation, equation still stands. Now, there, I don't know anything about. Uh, obviously, I don't. I'm not privy to this kind of information as to what Israel uh, did in South Lebanon in this clandestine operation. What it hit. Uh, I don't know. The fact that it was meant to be hushed for Hezbollah only to know is also, in a way, coming from the same, uh, still coming from the same place of we don't want to 
poke this too hard. We don't want this to turn into war because we don't want to go to war with Hezbollah at this moment. Now, again, like I said earlier, there are there is a reasoning for it, right? Assuming, of course, uh, there is a strike coming on Iran. And incidentally, I mean, if you look at it from, uh, you know, like a rational, if you game it out, right? Uh, uh, it's Netanyahu's uh, really, uh, it's, his, it's his only play in a way, right? Like if you, if America is telling you, I want to align with your mortal enemy and I'm going to place immense pressure on you. And then when you're out of government, Whoever replaces you, I want them to integrate more with that Iranian uh, uh, potential ally, a new ally of mine. Uh, and so, if that's the case, and that guy is that uh, that enemy is, you know, ringing you with a circle of fire, basically from uh, all directions, then your then your uh, th- then your play. If you want to turn the table, basically, you say, uh, okay, well, good luck allying with uh, basically smoldering. Uh, ash heap. Uh, so uh, that's that would be a logical um, uh, play for him. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's, if he's capable of it. I don't know if it's forthcoming. There's a lot of people who are talking about it. A lot of people have been talking about it. I have no idea of saying it. So uh, of saying one way or another. But the point is, if we're still playing with this tit for tat game then I don't think necessarily that the deterrence with Hezbollah is going to be what they think it is. They'll just calibrate. It just becomes a recalibration of, well, okay, so we can't push this far. We can maybe pull back and continue to poke from here, continue to poke from there, and we'll see what they're... What they're re- because that's what's really what, what the post-May 21 rockets from Lebanon that were all billed as Hamas. There is no such thing as Hamas infrastructure. Whatever there is, exists as a function of the IRGC and Hezbollah. And and, and it exists in as much as they want to oper- operationalize it. It doesn't exist on its own. Like this idea, well, you know, they might be getting precision missiles. To do what with? They're going to fire precision missiles on their own. They're going to fire them in a context with Hezbollah and the RAGC. It's not going to happen by themselves, right? So the whole thing about the Hamas business is just a way for the IDF to find a a loophole within the rules of of engagement to uh, be able to respond in a way that doesn't lead to war with Hezbollah. That's all. That's all really that this this is about. That's why the IDF has been putting it out for all this time, uh, in my mind. But... It Let started. Me just, I just want to go. Was, I just this go one, one last, for, just one last, one last, yeah. just a small point. So when the when the missile salvo, a rocket salvo, started in twenty one, there were a lot less and a lot more rudimentary. Two years later, you have thirty four of them. Okay, and 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 it's, and it's they didn't miss as much as they did last time, right? So that's what I meant. Like you calibrate. Like okay, so they tested it in twenty one. They saw what the IDF response was. Like, okay, this works. Now let's up it up a little bit. Now, if there is a hit, like Netanyahu says, it doesn't necessarily mean that it ends. It just means that you're recalibrated in a different way, perhaps. Anyway, we, it all remains to be seen. I, you know, I don't know anything about uh, what actually was hit, and uh, let alone how Hezbollah will re- respond to it. So, so that really brings me back to where I said I wanted to go before, which I sort of gave the the curtain raiser for, which was which was the Abraham Accords and how we're supposed to look. I mean, I don't even see the Abraham Accords in and of themselves as that interesting in the sense of, oh, these four peace deals that we got with these four secrete countries. Because really, I mean, what it, to me, symbolized more was the United States uh, coming in and essentially taking over this working partnership that, I mean, it's less than an alliance, obviously, but, you know, call it whatever you want. It's also more important and or more credible than some alliances that are formal. At any rate, you know, that you had uh, cooperation, operational cooperation based on shared interests between Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt under uh, Sisi and um, the UAE under MBZ and um, Bahrain, uh, which has been fighting fighting Iran for some time. And then, you know, Morocco came in because they had the Polisario in the Western Sahara and Sudan whether they remain in, whether they're going into another civil war, we don't know. But they also had their interest in coming into this. And Indonesia was on the side. So, I mean, like, there are all these different groups. And now we see Israel acting regionally um, or trying to and sort of being rebuffed 
like you see Saudi Arabia uh, pushing away from Israel, agreeing to a Chinese mediated um, non I don't know non aggression pact with uh, with Iran. You know I don't know if this is like the Molotov Ribbentrop pact or whether it's just a hoodna, you know, when trying to figure out what to do about that because they don't have America around to protect them anymore, you know, and how how to look at that. On the other hand, you also have Israel strengthening its cooperation with Azerbaijan. The foreign minister is is going to visit Azerbaijan this week. I had uh, Michael Duran, uh, Duran on this show, your writing partner, um, a couple of weeks ago talking about the strategic importance of Israel, Azerbaijani. Uh, uh, ties and alignment and what that does for Israeli-Turkey uh, ties, although Turkey's been very, very hostile towards Israel in this proclamations by Erdogan over recent weeks. But basically, after I've thrown in all of these details together, the specific question is, is it, it now that we're seeing, again, the United States sort of uh, going back to where they were under Obama in terms of turning their back on degrading, humiliating their allies in in an in an effort to realign towards Iran. Um, uh, whether Israel is going to be able to uh, renew the alliances that to you know their their operational capacity pre Trump. Or whether there's too much water under the bridge, whether Iran, its uh, nuclear uh, capabilities are too advanced or whatever. I mean, how do you see the potential for continued operational cooperation between Israel and, and regional players in this new sort of evolved to an even worse position situation in Obama's third term uh, under Biden? Uh, yeah, so I mean, the common denominator to all of this is Washington, right? That's that's the glue that holds all of this together. Uh, I, I agree that the Abraham Accords in and of themselves aren't uh, the story. The story is that the United States is, um, like I said, defining regional camps, defining its strategic posture in the region, that we are here, we lead this camp with, um, regardless of the tensions or friendships that they have among each other. And, but that's clearly defined and that's ours. And then on the other side, there's something else and that's enemies and these are friends. That's the, the bottom line of all of it, right? Um, they, uh, that's the common denominator with what's happening with Saudi Arabia today and uh, and and China, right? The point of the Saudi, um, as you called it, I think it's actually not a bad uh, description, right? Like the non-aggression pact uh, with with Iran. Not that incidentally, Saudi was aggressing <laughs> Iran anywhere in the region. That's the biggest myth, right? Like that it was very useful for Obama to use it as a cudgel against the Saudis. That somehow, oh, there's this Sunni Shiite sectarian war, and it's like, and so basically, Iran and Saudi are on the same pedestal because. They're terrible. The Iran, the well, Saudis I mean, it's are, a cycle of violence between Palestinian terrorists and, correct, and Israeli right. defenders. You know, it's exact right. same concept, it's like, right? So it helped. It helped them, but it's not. The Saudis weren't launching proxy wars uh, throughout the region uh, against independent, you know, in meddling in independent states' affairs and so on and so forth. Not even the Yemen war was that. The Yemen war was basically a, a, a IRGC uh, ally uh, taking hold on. Riyadh's border uh, and on the you know choke points and maritime choke points and so on. So uh, th the point of it all is that they're not. It's not about Iran. It's about Saudi. It's it's about the the U.S. Right. So them reaching out to China is in a way. A, I, I I used in one of my articles. I said that they they're kind of hoping or they're wishing for some sort of a time machine, really, where things can kind of go back to the arrangement that was beneficial to any everyone. Right, uh, that uh, between Saudi Arabia and 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 the United States, um, and it was clearly defined, and everyone understood where they stood. Now you have something very different, and and the United States is advertising that it doesn't want that old arrangement anymore under under Obama 
uh, you know, leading to today, right? And and they need um, uh, they need something <laughs> to uh, uh, to create that sense of um, uh, um, predictability that they were accustomed to in a in a in an you know a world gone upside down since since Obama came into office. So that I think is what they're trying with China to see. Look, if we can keep if the Chinese can somehow keep the Iranians in this specific context, which is mainly about Yemen more than anything else, uh, where you know drones and missiles aren't raining down on our cities, then fine. Then, okay, great. Then the Chinese are welcome to have it because the Americans have forfeited it. They don't want it. The Americans want something else. So what do you want us to do? That's the Saudi position. That's their, you know, that's of course, their the Chinese are are very close to Iran. I mean, the Chinese. Oh are, yeah, no, no. That's the, I'm, I'm not even. I'm yeah. I'm not even saying that it's a smart or it's going to work or whatever. I'm just saying that that's where these guys are coming from. Uh, so no, I get that, but I'm just asking because on the other hand, in 2013, when all when they began turning towards Israel, they weren't turning towards China, right? They were turning towards Israel, like they were. They were looking at Israel as an ally against the Muslim Brotherhood, against Iran. I don't know. Ally is a strong word, but you understand what I mean. A, a partner, right, in in managing these these common threats. Yeah, I don't think the clandestine stuff necessarily need to stop. I mean, I don't know if they will necessarily continue at the same pace or... Um, because, I mean, now intensity. it's like... Because now is what they call the money time, right? I mean, now... Iran is well, is at the door of the nuclear club, right? So if you're going to well, strike, right. and well, who's going to strike? It wasn't the Saudis who were going to strike, right? So the idea again, it goes back to what I said about Netanyahu's play, right? If you it, Netanyahu has always uh, sold the Abraham his role in the Abraham Accords and his conception of it exactly along the li lines you that you said that they saw. Israeli resolve and Israeli strength as an asset against the Iranians at a time of American uh, uh, change, deciding that they want to change the rules and, and moving towards Iran. Okay, but if Israel then is uh, hamstrung on that uh, on that note, then those guys are going to, by definition, that's what. That's what the Gulf uh, and that's what the, the Arabs in general do is they're going to duck for cover. Right. So uh, uh, so what the Saudis did here is kind of in between. It's not yet. It's not. Well, we're you know, we're out. It's like, OK, look, we have this thing. We're going to tap out for a second. If the Israelis now, if that's the moment that they see as. Uh, existentially, as we do with the, with regards to the Iranians, because the Saudis are saying if the Iranians get a bomb, all bets are off. We're going to get a bomb, and so on. So, uh, so if it, whether that's true or not, it's a different story. But but that means they have no faith in American protection either. So all the stuff that they're trying to sell them, missile integration, that's all stuff that Obama was this uh, snake oil that Obama was trying to sell them back in 2015. They know this. They're not interested in it. Uh, uh, so they. Um, if Israel does do it, and the Iranians are, uh, their, their program is, uh, their push towards the bomb is broken. And remember, the American posture now, you saw what uh, Milley said. All of a sudden, the language changed that the issue is about denying Iran the ability to have a fielded nuclear weapon, and so on, right? So if Israel hits, then, uh, then things, dynamics change. If Israel is... Uh, constrained and uh, Netanyahu, who knows if uh, what you know, with all the turmoil that the Americans are fostering in Israel, all the factionalism that they're fostering, all the Palestinian stuff that's happening, if all of that somehow leads to an inability, this American pressure leads to an inability to. And there's an interesting thing about the leak, by the way, with the the that came out from the Pentagon leaks about the Mossad and the Mossad. So like somehow the United States having visibility with the Mossad, you know, uh, uh, going back. I think you wrote about this in one of your columns, going back to Mayor Dagan. And it's like, mm, well, what does that mean? Does the, are they are they advertising their visibility into plans and their ability to stop them, with, when, which they boasted about back then? Um, uh, so 
the point of all of this is if Israel does it, then we're in a different uh, uh, in a different game. If Israel doesn't do it, then the Arabs basically will have uh, cleared themselves. Like, okay, it is what it is now. We're still in another world, but then we, we deal with it differently. It do, again, it doesn't mean that they don't continue. And by the way, and that extends to Turkey too, meaning their Saudi relations to Turkey. Look at what they've been doing. They've been investing in Turkey. They, they put... Um, they put money in the banks to stabilize the currency. They they understand in the regional, and this is something I uh, I share with Mike Duran in terms of our conception of what the countries that matter in the region for different uh, reasons. Right, you have Israel's military uh, uh, prowess and technological prowess on the one hand. It has different vulnerabilities, but it has that power. Saudi has military vulnerabilities, but it has different levers of power. And then you have Turkey. And those are kind of the, that's kind of the triangle of U.S. allies that are capable U.S. allies in the region that the United States can, can work with. Um, so the Saudis understand that as well, hence their investment in Turkey. And I think their continued lines of communication uh, with, with, with the Israelis. But the, the pivot is all about America's, uh, or the hinge rather, is um, uh, America vis-a-vis -vis Iran. America's push under the Obama-Biden team is to go toward, toward Iran and potentially even uh, uh, acquiesce to them as a threshold nuclear power or, or more uh, than that. Uh, the play for Netanyahu, you know, the, the idea of, that, of him influencing America, I don't think that's a... I don't think that's uh, uh, going to work. It didn't work under Obama. It's not going to work now. Um, so his play really is about whether or not he can affect things on the Iranian side, and that remains to be seen. I mean, I don't know. No, we'll have to we'll have to see. But you're, I think you're right. I think that Israel's play, in term, I mean, is is to prove that we are an independent actor capable of taking care of business, and obviously. If we're arguing about whether Hamas is is independent when it's you know self evidently Iran and Hezbollah dependent um, is not going to get us to the place where we need to go, but I think we're going to have to end it there for now and and cross our fingers and that these people know that they're talking nonsense and that they're not acting foolishly. Uh, so all right, well I appreciate your insights again, uh, Tony and. Um, We'll see you guys next week. I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's going to be a special for your mode. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'll figure out, I promise. And uh, so we'll see you again next week on the Carolyn Glick Show and hope for uh, quiet and uh, meaningful days ahead. But uh, no more violence, God willing, at least none that we're not fomenting. So, all right. Okay. On that happy note, thank you so much, Tony. And thank you guys thank for you. watching. Thank Remember... Remember to subscribe to JNS and to Carolyn Glick channel so that we can get the word out as far as possible. Because as you can see, my guests are just simply brilliant. All right. Take care.